And today, our special guest here on Fire Breathing Rob, this is a legend and a great political strategist, Chuck Rocha. He is the former senior advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders and also the founder of Solitary uh, Strategies. And he also has a new book out, T.O. Bernie. So definitely check it out if you're a huge Bernie Sanders fan, which I know a lot of the viewers are. So first of all, Mr. Rocha, thanks so much. It's a privilege. Rob, it's good to be on. We may have to get a translator for my friends and your friends to understand us, but I'm glad to be here. If you could tell the viewers a little bit about you growing up in Texas and also what got you into politics in general? I grew up in rural East Texas. Uh, I was the son of a single mother. My father was Mexican and my mother was white and Native American. My dad left when I was five and I grew up in a trailer house next to my grandmother, my white grandmother, uh, in the middle of the country. And I tell people that story to understand that I'm a national political consultant and all this big to do TV, but I grew up like every other regular person in America, living in a trailer house, figuring out how my mom was gonna make it and having to probably do things that a you know eight, nine year old didn't have to do to take care of their sister. I think that's what makes me a decent consultant is living through those hardships and understanding the real toils that working Americans have to go through every day. And then being from a multicultural biracial marriage a relationship with Mexican and uh, white people. Like I got to go back and forth between these two communities, which really made me look at the world through a different lens. And then I went to work in a factory when I was 19, making Kelly Springfield tires. And there I joined the union and I didn't know anything about unions. I wasn't an activist. I'd never went to college. I wasn't, you know, some liberal icon. I was just a worker. And I just kind of got in the book. I tell the story about how I got involved and and started getting involved with the local Democratic Party and knocking on doors and putting up yard signs. And that was really, uh, Rob, how I got involved and got first time ever, you know, voting and getting involved in campaigns. So I know you were involved with the AFL-CIO, obviously worked on Bernie 2016 and 2020. Was that the reason why you wanted to tell the story of T.O. Bernie and why you wrote it? It was two parts. One is I wanted to tell this exceptional Latino outreach that we really had done for Bernie that would uh, kind of solidify our place in history around getting Latinos out because as a Latino and working a lot in Latino politics, I was sick and tired of hearing people say Latinos don't vote when I knew and Rob, you probably know that Latinos will vote. If you'll go ask them to vote and spend money to ask them to vote, even in Providence where there's a sizable Latino population who I've worked with. If you go talk to them and talk to them with cultural competency, not that they're Mexicans, but that they are Puerto Rican, they are Guatemalan that where they're from, then that's how you do that. And that's what we did with Bernie. So that's A. B was also to tell my story and to let people know that you don't have to go to Yale and Harvard and your mom and daddy don't have to be rich for you to be a success in politics. I grew up with nothing. I've never been to college. I was a single father myself at 19. I was convicted of a nonviolent felon 10 years ago. Like I've rebuilt my life and wanted it to be an example to every young man and woman out there who may not have much, who may have made mistakes of their own, that you can, and there is a road to redemption through hard work if you live your values and work for people you believe in, like Bernie Sanders. I agree. And I wanted to talk about that Latino outreach. Again, this is Chuck Rocha, former senior advisor to Bernie Sanders, and also definitely look out for his book, T.O. Bernie. Chuck, my thing is with the voter outreach, I mean, you guys did such a great job, and you yourself personally did such a great job in Nevada. And I listened to you many times, like I said, before the interview started on Rising and on other shows, speak about being in Nevada, talking to and Latinos all over Nevada, buying that cheap radio time where a lot of people said that didn't make a difference, but you did that and it made a huge difference for Bernie in Nevada, also winning big in California and also winning in Colorado. Do you feel like that was the big reason why you guys won was because of talking to those people, getting on the ground at the beginning, way before all these other candidates did, and you know, those radio ads. All of that is important, Rob, and I think that it's not just one thing. I think it's a combination of all those things. It starts with starting early. That's the most important thing. As you know this, Rob, in any campaign you've worked in, we usually wait right to the very end to talk to black people and brown people. We just consider them a GOTV universe. They spend all of this money early talking to persuadable white voters in the suburbs. How are we going to get, like, if we did that same operation to black and brown people, man, campaigns would look much different. So we use that technology. Let's start early. So that's A. B, we, we, use, we use different targeting. And let me give you one example because you're a political animal like I am. 
there's only 19,000 Latinos who have ever caucused in Nevada. So I knew as a strategist, all the campaigns probably would talk to those 19,000 Latinos at some time. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that the Nevada caucus was gonna make it more open to where they were gonna have like early voting caucus days where you didn't just have to show up on that one day, which opened up more opportunities for more Latinos to participate. So I broadened our target of Latinos we were talking to. So I took the 19,000, guess what I did? I added in 30,000 Latinos who had a regular primary voting history, but had never caucused. Now my universe is around 40 Gs. And then I took in the ones that had voted in general elections, but had never really voted sporadically in primaries, but they had a voting history. They knew they voted sometimes, added in them into my, and then here was the jujitsu in the book. I added in a bunch of newly registered Latinos that I knew nobody was talking to, right? So then I had a universe of almost 125,000 Latinos that I send mail pieces to, digital ads to, TV commercials to, radio to. And then that is how I ended up with this big turnout where Bernie Sanders dominated it because we were the only ones not only starting early, but talking to the, all of the segments of the population. Well, well, my thing is that you did the same in Iowa, too. We look at the satellite caucuses in Iowa. They went overwhelmingly for Bernie. Latino voting was huge for Bernie in Iowa. I think that was rigged, me personally, but we'll move on to the uh, the next part of this. Uh, my thing is with uh, the Biden campaign, and I know, and I heard you to speak about this a couple weeks back on Rising. You know, the Biden campaign, they chose Anna Navarro, who is a Republican, for the Latino outreach strategy. I don't understand why they didn't choose somebody like yourself that kicked butt in Nevada, in California, Colorado, Iowa too, and put in somebody that's a Republican that doesn't know anything about the Democratic base. It seems like they're losing this election. We see, you know, Latinos, I'm in Florida right now. We see Latinos in Florida going overwhelmingly now against Biden. You know, he may still win the vote, but he's losing Latino voters in Florida. It's disgusting. I think there was a too much of an emphasis a lot of times put on uh, the Cuban vote. And we talk about the yeah. Cuban vote a whole lot, right? And Anna Navarro's from that, and I don't want to disparage her. She's got her own thing. She should do her own thing. And she's not a part of the official campaign, She, but she is helping them with the Latino vote mm -hmm. in Miami with a group she does know, which is these Cuban Republicans. And I'm sure all of your listeners are astute like you are, but just in case some of you are not, you should know that Cubans vote Republican about 60, 70% of the time. All the older Cubans always vote for Republicans. And so my point here is, let's just think about what we've just said about the Latino vote. So you have this one little enclave of Latino voters that are Cuban in, in Miami, right? And many of them, over half of them wear their MAGA hats every day. They are like your cousin in Texas who loves and thinks that Donald Trump is the second coming of Jesus Christ and they wouldn't vote for any Democrat dog, no matter who they are. But we spend all this time talking about them like they're gonna act like a Mexican or a Puerto Rican and they're just never going to be that way, right? Yeah. So why don't we take the money that we're gonna spend trying to convince again, this is like the white voters. Why spend so much money trying to persuade Cubans who are never gonna be with you except for a small group of younger Cubans and middle-aged Cubans. And you should go do that. But double down with Puerto Ricans who love you who are already voting for you at 69 or 70%, let's get that number up to 80 and not worry about the losses with the group of Republican Latinos who ain't never going to vote for you no matter what you tell them. Well, It's just this, general strategy. Right. Sorry to interrupt you. Now, I was just saying, you know, I'm in Orlando area right now, loaded with Puerto Ricans. We even have Venezuelans over here, Mexicans. You know, the thing I feel like, and, and you're a strategist, so you may agree with this, may disagree. The thing I uh, get upset with the Democratic Party is, is that they lump Latinos into one group. And it's all about immigration, where these Latinos, Puerto Ricans, Venezuelans, Colombians, all in the central Florida area, you know, they care about immigration, but it's not just immigration. It's about health care. It's about jobs. It's about environmental issues. Well, you know, it's, I try to and nuance this a lot with yeah. immigration. Like what regular consultants in the establishment hierarchy don't understand is there's a way to use immigration. Immigration never shows mm -hmm. up as the most important election reason that you're going to go vote for most Latino voters. It's still a very important issue in the community. But when you say, what's the most important, uh, what's the most important issue to you this election cycle, like a pollster would add? Guess what, Rob? They say jobs, the economy. Right now they all say, coronavirus, which is killing my family. I'm, they're talked about being essential workers, like our community is taking the brunt 
of a hammer blow from coronavirus. But here's how we used immigration for Bernie Sanders as an emotional issue. And people in the campaign thought I was crazy when I really, and I think I talked about this in the book. The first ad we ever ran and the first mail piece talked about Bernie Sanders immigrant roots. The ad I wrote said, hello, this is Bernie Sanders. Or that, did you know Bernie Sanders' father immigrated here from another country and he couldn't speak English and he had no money, but he lived that real immigrant experience. And I lived in that immigrant home. And I won't forget that immigrant experience when I'm in the White House. And I understand the struggles. And what that does, Rob, is it just breaks down barriers to have a conversation now with somebody because you have some commonality. The problem is most politicians wait to have the first conversation with a Latino six to four weeks before the election. And we did this six months. So then after we broke that barrier down using immigrant and the common story of Bernie Sanders being the son of an immigrant, then I could have a conversation about, and here's what Medicare for all would do for you. And here's what the Green New Deal can mean to you. So it, then we start talking about issues that just guess what? They align perfectly with Latinos who care about the minimum wage, who care about uh, health care, which was the number one issue in the primary. And that's how we built this momentum. Well, I, I want to go into this and go more in depth in the campaign. And if you could do a, a small deep dive into what went wrong in the 2020 Sanders campaign. Yep. Uh, First of all, I have no proof of who put out the call or the coordination that you would talk about. Sure. But here's what I do know. And here's the one reason for all your listeners about why Bernie Sanders is not the nominee. And it's just one reason. We came out of Nevada, and this is in the book. I openly talk about this, that after Nevada, we had polling from our own poster where we were polling in every Super Tuesday state that showed Bernie Sanders winning. Yeah. He was winning every state, even Florida by two points. I'll never forget it. Wow. Uh, he was winning North Carolina by three. Uh, and the reason for that for political animals like you, Rob, and your listeners is that because of a multi-candidate primary and because Mike Bloomberg had spent millions and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, his number, Bloomberg's number, had crept into the early 20s. So in every state, Mike Bloomberg at this point is getting between 15 and 22 percent in every state, okay? So he had taken most of that directly from Biden and a handful of other candidates. So in every state on Super Tuesday, Bernie Sanders is at 25% in almost every state. Then there was Joe Biden and Bloomberg at between 19 and 22. And then there was Elizabeth Warren or Pete Buttigieg in the high single digits. And that's just where the race was, right? We knew from day one, Rob, when I said in the first meeting that I outlined in the book, a year before Bernie announced, when we had our first strategic meeting about him running for president with Bernie and Jane and, and uh, Ari and Jeff and us, I talk about that meeting. Because Bernie was like, he didn't know if he was gonna run, but he wanted us to explain to him how he could win if he did win. And we knew that we could raise $200 million, which we did. We also knew that we would have a, a base to build from that other people wouldn't, but we also knew we wouldn't get near the support we got because there's a multi-candidate primary. But we knew that we would, in a multi-candidate primary, have this super duper floor that was 25%, which in most cases, as long as people stayed in the race through Super Tuesday, would guarantee us victory unless something bad happened. And it was all playing out exactly right. We had imagined people like Pete Buttigieg would spike from time to time or Elizabeth Warren, they would be this fly, but we knew they didn't have the money for the longevity, right? And so what happened was somebody or something had the same polling that we had. And any strategist that's worked half their weight in anything would have been doing the same polling as us. And somebody knew Bernie Sanders was about five days from being the Democratic nominee with no way to stop him. Because once we make that clean sweep on Super Tuesday, Rob, you're shaking your head because you know it was over at that point. It was just going to be over. For, so, but for some reason, and it seemed awful strange that they all did it at the same time, everybody gets out of the race all at the same time and we know it's going to become much harder on Super Tuesday in a two-man race. And that's, that's literally why he's not the nominee. Then momentum took over after that point, right? It's just the reason it was. And to answer one more debunked myth about black voters in South Carolina, here's yes. something that nobody knows. Bernie Sanders spent more money advertising to black voters than any campaign this cycle. Anybody in the primary. We, had, we spent more money, and I tracked $5.8 million. Bernie Sanders had more black staff than any campaign. Bernie Sanders' staff in South Carolina was 80% black and 78% from South Carolina. 
So I tell you all of that to say, Chuck Roach is an old operative that knows what I'm doing. And so I did exactly what the textbook said you should have done the first time. Hire black people, spend money talking to black people, prioritize them early. We started early. But here's what's underreported. That the average age of a black person who voted in the Democratic primary in South Carolina is over 60 years old. Yeah. Black people who vote are old. White people who vote are old. And guess what all of those old people have in common? They all hate Bernie Sanders. These people didn't vote for Bernie Sanders because they were black and he didn't connect. They voted for him because they were old and they didn't think he could win in the general election, just like old white people, right? People always come to me and say, but Chuck, you got Latinos to vote for Bernie. Well, here's some news for you. Latinos ain't black people. And in a primary, the average age of a Latino voting in the primary was 29 years old. Wow. So it's the difference between an electorate that's average age of 29 to an average age of somebody who's 60 who voted in the South Carolina primary who's black, right? Because we spent the money and it just never resonated, right? And it just never worked. And we finally figured out it's because these people will never be talked into thinking Bernie Sanders could win the general election. But guess what? Just like old white people never were either, right? As far as Joe Biden being the most electable, I see Bernie Sanders, you know, I'm a little biased because I'm a Sanders supporter, but I see Bernie being the most electable. He can get the young people energized. I don't know anybody in Florida or Rhode Island, for that matter, that's ex excited to go and vote for Joe Biden. I mean, if you know, you're in Texas, so do you see anybody that's excited to vote for no, Joe Biden? I'm in the bubble in D.C., but I'm from oh, Texas. Okay. okay, I live in D.C., but you're right. I'm from Texas, but I get to travel around the country, and none of my friends are Wall Street bankers, or none of my friends are like, like you know where I come from. You read the book. You know what the book says. And I think that people were just, I think, I think the establishment wing of the party just wanted a safe option to go against the craziest man out there who just really don't think that and I don't think that their thinking is right, Rob. I'm just telling you what they think is that they wanted the safe alternative, right? Pete Buttigieg was even that safe alternative for a split second. Like they just wanted something and they just never will understand that somebody like Bernie Sanders would relate with the general population as much as me and you do because it's been so long since many of them have actually been out in the real world because this older group of voters who are the base of a lot of our vote uh, thinks the same way. Let's be honest. Like that's why they voted for him and kudos to them. They beat me on the battlefield. Like I will take anybody on and I'll run my strategy against anybody, but I also lost. And, and, and it, sure, it was very few people in very few states, but me and you both know that Bernie Sanders motivates lots of people and that his messaging does. And I think we lost this battle, but like you said about AOC and other people, this war about the, the soul of the party will go on. And the good news for you and for other people out there is you should be talking about investing more in Latinos, not just because Chuck Roach is a brown Jesus and thinks that I know everything because I don't. But what I do know is that they're a younger demographic and they could be the next wave of progressives that change the party forever because their demographic growth is just undeniable on the way it could have impact. But we've got to go talk to them and explain to them why they are progressives. I have three more quick questions. This is Chuck Roach here on Fire Breathing Rob. But Chuck, I want to talk about this because a lot of progressives speak about this. They, they are really upset that Bernie Sanders dropped out. I know Bernie's 78, and I know he had that heart attack at the beginning. But my thing is, is that I feel like if Bernie stayed in the race, and you know all the inside information, so you can tell the viewers this, but Bernie, this is his time right now. We need Medicare for all right now. We need a Green New Deal. We need UBI with the health care crisis, the jobless crisis, and the environmental crisis. So what would you say to progressives that love Bernie Sanders that are really ticked off that he dropped out in a time where we need his policies? I think that he just did not want to see himself as uh, destroying any chance that Democrats had of winning the White House. It was mathematically over for him, but I don't think Bernie Sanders is going a damn place. And I know he's not because I still get to talk to him. He's still going to be driving this policy. And can you imagine an administration if Joe Biden wins and he appoints Bernie Sanders to be the secretary of labor? And that, you know, that that's what, you know, America needs is we're going to get to the place of where Bernie Sanders policies are because they just align with young people. It's just not going to happen as fast as people like me and you, Rob, and the activists out there want it to happen. Uh, but in fact, it will. And he's not going to go away and he's going to hold people accountable. And there's going to be 
several generations of the next Bernie's who are going to prove, and you know what the single reason behind it is, is there's this money people can raise now online. We never could raise enough money to be competitive with corporate PACs and Wall Street donors, but now because of grassroots fundraising, it's really leveled the playing field to give people like AOC and Jamal a shot at actually making a difference. But are you worried that, because we know Bernie has half of the base of the Democratic Party in the bag right now as being a progressives, democratic socialist, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call yourself. But my thing is, we see the Democratic Party going after moderate Republican voters, white suburbanites, and the professional class, Chuck. So, you know, what do you think about that? Now, I'm worried if Joe Biden wins, he's going to cater to that group instead of catering to progressives. Look, we're never going to get we're never going to get everything we could have got out of Bernie Sanders. And you're yeah. right. I don't agree with all of their strategies on the way that they're doing it, but Bernie's going to go on the road and try to deliver some of the votes. And I know, and I tell people this all the time that I would much rather be trying to hold Joe Biden accountable than the Democrats than trying to talk Donald Trump into something. Cause I'm going to get about mm, 50, 60, 70% of what I want. And it's better than what I'm currently getting, which is maybe one or 10 percent because I, I agree on criminal justice reform you know that he's supposed to be doing some stuff on i just wish he would pardon me and i'd get on anyway uh <laughs> that's a joke i don't want I know, Donald Trump I to pardon me but anyway <laughs> so i think that we can get there through grassroots activism on holding these democrats accountable imagine this rob joe biden is elected we w we keep the house and we maybe win back the senate well, then we have a whole new power of holding these Democrats accountable because of what AOC and others have done by saying, look, if you don't get with us, we will run somebody against you in your primary in two years. You better get your shit together. Now, I agree 100%. So the last question before we end the interview, and this is Chuck Rocha. Definitely check out his book, T.O. Bernie. Where do you um, rather... Who do you feel like the rising stars are in the progressive move movement? Now, we talk about AOC, Ilhan Omar, the squad in general, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman will join them in the next Congress. Uh, but as far as maybe somebody that might run for president, challenge if Joe Biden wins, uh, maybe uh, Kamala Harris in 2024. Do you see anybody jumping up there? I think you have to look around and watch the governors and watch, you know, people that are moving up through state politics. You know, they may not be as progressive right now, but there are people like uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham in New Mexico, a Latina. You know, she always had a pretty liberal record in Congress. She represented the city of Albuquerque, right? Like, like these people of color, I think that we need to have more representation. I think, look, a Kamala uh, being a, a, a multicultural uh, woman of color is, is something cool. Uh, but I think that there are other people out there at the state level who are going to make dramatic impacts. Like who's going to run for governor in Rhode Island in two years? You know, Alors is going to run. The lieutenant right. governor is going to run. You're going to have uh, the secretary of state who's a woman of color running. Like those kind of people, I think, are the next rounds of who, who runs to the left in those states to do something very, very impactful. And then there's just a whole slew of congressional people like Ruben Gallego, uh, uh, Veronica Escobar, uh, uh, the El Paso congresswoman who took Beto's seat, who is just a real good progressive. Like, that's the kind of people I'm keeping my eye on. All right, Chuck, thanks so much for your time. Definitely check out the book, T.O. Bernie, and we'll look forward to talking to you down the road. And thanks so much for doing what you did on the Sanders campaign and helping progressives in general get elected. We need more people like you as far as strategists in general. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for All having right. me. Thanks so much, Chuck. I appreciate it.